Okay, so in the last two presentations, we had uh, discussed uh, the water society and sustainability within urban context, right? So how uh, I mean, what are the complex and what are the additional di dimensions uh, when we discuss about the relationship between water and society when the urban is there in the backdrop? So, now uh, this would become uh, more clear when we uh, basically would focus on, uh, on different case studies or numerous case studies because each and every city has its own story and uh, each and every city has its own story so far as the relationship between the urban and its beyond urban counterpart is concerned. So, we would be mainly focusing on city and its wider ecological surroundings and it would be interesting to focus on Kolkata. So, this uh, the title of the presentation is transforming trajectories of blue infrastructures of Kolkata. So, Kolkata would be a fascinating case for us to understand the relationship between water society and uh, sustainability because uh, Kolkata's wider surroundings it actually comprise of river bodies river bodies, water bodies, rivers, distributaries, tributaries, inlets, canals, creeks, ocean and what not. So, Kolkata is an integral part of this uh, lower Gangetic basin and it is it also uh, you know it is a continuum uh, to the Indian Sundarbans which is the deltaic uh, part of the uh, Ganges and uh, so uh, it would be very interesting to see that how I mean the relationship between the water bodies the relationship between these wider ecological infrastructure or surrounding in form of rivers and water bodies in the making and unmaking of the city across historical scales of course. So, uh, this is uh, an interesting uh, picture showing uh, two uh, fisher women uh, from the East Kolkata wetlands. So, in the background you see the water body uh, which is a part of the East Kolkata wetlands that I will be discussing in detail here and these are the uh, development projects know the IT uh, farm and also these are these are the this is the IT complex. So, which has actually so this entire uh, area has uh, uh, developed by encroaching upon uh, the wetlands and how uh, that is actually um, affecting the sustainable flows between uh, the city and its wetlands. So, that would be uh, an area which we will be focusing on. So, this is an interesting picture that uh, uh, that uh, you know uh, that uh, reflects on lives and livelihoods of these uh, fishing communities, the wetlands which is the physical ecosystem, the physical environment and also uh, the development projects and the relationship between these three. So, these are a few uh, old pictures uh, from uh, I mean of uh, colonial Calcutta. So, Calcutta had always meant you know uh, uh, waterscapes or riverscapes because uh, on one hand we have the Hooghly river. So, this is the uh, this is the famous uh, Hooghly river the lifeline of uh, the city. So, the busy Calcutta port on the Hooghly river this is the famous uh, you know uh, heritage uh, river uh, the Adi Ganga again part of the uh, Ganges and an old uh, you know uh, old bed and old stream from the Ganges and again this uh, particular river it is extremely thickly loaded uh, with history because on its banks uh, we had this Kali Ghat the famous uh, Kali temple and uh, so it, it, it has uh, it has its historical and cultural past. So, these are some of the old um, pictures or old illustrations of uh, colonial Calcutta. And now, if we take a look into the contemporary times, these are some newspaper clippings you know uh, from the contemporary times uh, from like 2008, 9 till the present. So, here you can see how the uh, water bodies these are making way to you know uh, real estate. So, this is a map or the satellite image of 2014. So, these are all water bodies 
and now you can see how these water bodies had been encroached upon, how these water bodies had shrunk and how these had really made way to develop big, big development projects and uh, real estate speculation. So, within just the uh, uh, gap of uh, 3 years, so this is a change uh, between 2014 and 2017 and you can see how massively uh, the wetlands and the water bodies had been encroached upon. This is another unfortunate uh, story of the, the, so we just saw the uh, picture of the busy uh, Adi Gonga uh, and the boats on the Adi Gonga and the Kali temple on the bank of the Adi Gonga and uh, I mean it is very hard to imagine that this is the same Adi Gonga or the uh, heritage river uh, which had totally been you know slaughtered uh, due to the implementation of the metro railway extension uh, project uh, during I mean between like uh, during the first half of the 21st century, the first decade of the 21st century. So, old river choked by rail and so stinking river, disappearing rivers and this is another uh, data which shows that how water bodies have shrunk 77 percent in the last 14 years despite protective legislation and the status of a Ramsar site. Now, this is another crucial issue because uh, we will discuss that how uh, after a particular point of time few uh, environmentalists uh, and even some enthusiastic bureaucrats they joined hands with, uh, the, uh, with the environmentalists and how you know the green bench the, for the first time the green bench was formed within the Calcutta High Court on the particular issue of the protection uh, of wetlands. And finally, uh, they were able to mobilize the government and they were also able to uh, mobilize the Ramsar convention and 12,500 hectares of uh, wetlands uh, were, uh, were, were, were declared as the Ramsar site uh, in 2001-2002. So, which meant that the implication was that uh, uh, no further construction would be possible within this designated Ramsar site. But then it shows like how 77 percent you know uh, of water bodies even within the Ramsar designated site had uh, totally disappeared in the last uh, two decades or one and a half decades. So, now I will follow a methodology which is called backcasting. So, I will take you to uh, history, I will take you to the past and I will just discuss like I, so we saw two snapshots like one old Kolkata where one can easily associate Kolkata with our waterscapes, riverscapes and on uh, the other hand you know stinking water so from um, uh, canals to nalas or drains. So, so we saw two different pictures of old Kolkata and uh, contemporary Cal uh, Calcutta and now we will try to join the dots uh, between these two. Uh, so, this is a particular poem a very famous poem on Kolkata by uh, Rudyard Kipling city of dreadful night where um, uh, Kipling writes does the, does the midday halt of Charnok moors the pity grew a city. As the fungus sprouts chaotic from its bed, so it spread. Chance directed, chance erected, laid and built on the silt. Palace, buyer, hovel, poverty and pride side by side. And above the packed and pestilential town, death looked down. So, so like, uh, so it is clearly mentioned that uh, Kolkata is a chance directed and chance erected city, uh, which I will uh, try to you know counter and prove by my own research that it was really not a chance directed and chance erected city because there were very thorough, minute uh, strategic calculations behind uh, the foundation of Kolkata. The, the the role of ecology, or more specifically, role of waterscapes, was uh, extremely important. Uh, behind the selection of Kolkata as the seat of uh, colonial capital. But uh, as uh, Kipling mentions that uh, he talks about poverty, he talks about pestilence, uh, death and all that and this is quite true uh, in the sense that if we uh, uh, you know consult some um, colonial reports. Uh, we will find that uh, for example, the reports by Wilson or for example, the reports by Colebrook, rep even reports by Hamilton, it shows that how uh, I mean uh, they, uh, they actually try to describe uh, this particular space as, uh, as extremely unhealthy. 
because it was a malarial atmosphere and the Britishers were dying. So, it was extremely marshy, swampy and there were alligators and wild boars you know in, in the area. But then the whole question is uh, if this space was not attractive at all, why finally uh, the British uh, I mean they selected Kolkata as the seat of imperial capital. So, this is the question which we uh, need to really uh, you know explore. Uh, so, we find that if we consult other uh, documents for example, alternative documents we find that from the very beginning. So, Job Chano came here uh, in uh, 1690, but even before that since the 1660s the British they were actually trying to keep track of the Bhagirati Hugli river. Even during uh, I mean in the year 1667 um, Joseph Townsend he was appointed as the pilot of the Ganges and what was his role? His role was to you know keep detailed note of the length, uh, depth, channel length of the river and also sand variation pattern and all that. And he used to uh, uh, keep track of these details, these data and statistics and he used to send this to uh, London and the uh, London uh, court of committee they used to you know consult uh, these reports and see like whether these river um, uh, you know would be really significant uh, 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 through which they would be able to make their own fortune and fate. So, uh, so and uh, we, we see that uh, the, this is the first uh, map of uh, colonial I mean this is the first map of uh, Kolkata pre-colonial Kolkata actually uh, which is available um, at the National Archives and also at the West Bengal State Archive. So, it shows like uh, there is a river Hugli Bhagirati Hugli on one hand river Adi Ganga and uh, other creeks and canals three main locations the Gobindapur village, Chutanuti village and Kolikata and the huge salt water marshes which also has a very long 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 history. And uh, so, archaeological data uh, it I mean uh, archaeological data from these marshes uh, could actually um, uh, make a connection between uh, the Kolkata Sundarbans uh, continuum which is a, a separate issue uh, and which I would not cover uh, right now uh, in this presentation. But it is also important to know that on the e eastern part uh, there uh, there was uh, these uh, numerous there were these numerous water bodies uh, salty saline water bodies and this was saline because the Bhagirati uh, Hugli river it used to carry saline water from the Bay of Bengal as it was uh, connected with the Bay of Bengal and this uh, area it was an undulating uh, site or an undulating space. So, the water uh, saline water carried uh, by the Bhagirati Hugli river it uh, could not uh, you know get channelized or drained off. So, this uh, area uh, remained marshy. So, this was the uh, you know hydrological uh, situation or scenario of uh, the particular site when the British for the first time uh, came here during uh, 1660s and also more specifically from the 1690s. Now, what is more important is that uh, the British um, could think that if this particular space can be property uh, properly utilized if it can be tamed and manipulated through the use of their own hydraulic knowledge expertise and uh, you know technological intervention and innovation then this space can get transformed into a space through which maximization of profits could be made so what happened is that they manipulated this particular scape using the rivers two major rivers the Bhagirati Ugli river and the Vidyadhari river and also the numerous natural canals and creeks in between and they came up with a system which is known as the eastern canal system. So, they use this natural uh, uh, I mean natural uh, space or the natural uh, water courses and uh, rivers which were already there they manipulated it through the use of their own uh, technological expertise and hydraulic knowledge and they came up with a particular network which is known as the eastern canal network which was connected to the river Hugli on the west and river Vidyadhari on the east 
uh, and finally which was also connected to the salt water marshes. So, uh, so the connection with the salt water marshes were made at the uh, second stage uh, uh, much later. So, that again has another history which I will cover, but for the timing we need to remember that this uh, eastern canal system it was devised, it was designed and developed during the later half of the uh, 19th century and it was connected to the river Bhagirti Hugli on the west and river Vidyadhari uh, on the east and Vidyadhari uh, it acted as the major outfall channel for this entire area or for the uh, for this urban uh, uh, site or for this site which was gradually urbanizing. So, these are the names of the uh, canals within the eastern canal network, Belaghata circular canal, Newcott canal, Bhangar canal and Krishnapur canal which were all constructed between uh, 1810 and 1910 and of course, it is also uh, connected to the uh, Talis canal which is very important uh, the Adi Ganga that we had seen. So, uh, these uh, 5 canals plus the Talis canal which is a part of the eastern canal system and the Talis canal is uh, I mean uh, so with the Talis canal it becomes the south and eastern canal system. And one should also remember that it also includes uh, another I mean uh, it also includes the history of the uh, development and the construction of what is known as the combined scheme of uh, William Clark. Uh, which was implemented in 1865 and its combined scheme means it consists of uh, two canals like uh, the uh, strong weather flow canal and the dry weather flow canal SWF and DWF. So, uh, together with uh, these uh, five canals plus the Talis canal and the uh, strong weather flow and dry weather flow canal these were th this was an extensive network which uh, which 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 uh, actually uh, played the uh, played two major roles for this urbanizing city. So one was trade and transportation, and the other was drainage, sewerage, and sanitation. So this entire network of Eastern Canal system it was extremely important for uh, trade transportation purposes, but also for drainage, sewerage, sanitation purposes because we'll get to know that Kolkata from the very beginning it had no separate sewage uh, treatment plan, neither it, you know. Uh, so the canals it used to play the role of uh, you know the canal uh, the the uh, channels uh, carrying effluents and then getting connected to the river Vidyadiri which was the outfall channel and later it became connected to the wetlands uh, where the waste water or where the effluents were recycled. And uh, very interestingly like today we have seen like uh, the contemporary uh, scenario where we have seen how uh, metro uh, railway pillars had been constructed on the uh, Adi Ganga, but uh, if we just go back to 200 years we will find that the waterborne traffic uh, to Calcutta was 7 times as great as that carried by the eastern Bengal state train. So, nobody can even imagine that you know through those canals which uh, are totally you know uh, I mean they, the, the condition is so bad. So, nobody would say that these are water courses or canals rather you know uh, those are just considered as nalas or drains ok. So, because they are entirely uh, choked uh, and they stink. So, uh, but this is uh, a reality and uh, so history uh, teaches us that uh, this uh, I mean trade transportation or waterborne traffic through this uh, eastern canal system it was 7 times uh, great as great as that carried by the eastern Bengal state railway. Yeah, so this is um, a, a technical illustration of the the network. So, you can see. So, um, there is a very interesting uh, picture which uh, combines the history of uh, city or the urban technology and nature. So, uh, so, so, all the important channels the lake channel and not only the canals, uh, but also the sluice gates and the locks and this is the outfall channel the Bidyadari this is the Talis Nala which was revived by William Tali stretch of the Adi Ganga that we had seen and uh, numerous other canals and locks like the Chitpur lock and Bamangata lock and all that. So, it is the technical blueprint of the uh, extensive uh, eastern canal system.
which was designed by the British. So, uh, this is another uh, uh, interesting uh, history like how there was a transformation in the, in the aquatic environment of the marshes from saline to non-saline. So, we need to uh, know about uh, the Bidyadari river and how uh, there was a decline um, in the flow of the Bidyadari river and how finally, in uh, 1928 it was officially declared as dead because um, Vidyadari faced uh, numerous uh, interventions because many canals were actually uh, drawn uh, by taking water from or uh, uh, those were excavated by taking water from the Vidyadari river and also to a great extent it died uh, its natural death. So, there is a controversy among experts among the colonial experts that what led to the decline of the Vidyadari river. So, few uh, argue that you know uh, I mean Vidyadari uh, died its natural death, but others argue that so many intervention and disruption were made uh, to the river that finally, you know uh, there was a lot of reduction uh, in flow um, of the river. But whatever the uh, re uh, reasons or uh, causes might be, uh, the fact is that Vidyadari was declared as um, officially dead or defunct in the year 1928. Now, this is an important uh, uh, event because due to the decline of the Vidyadari river, the next question was what would be the alternative outfall channel for this urbanizing city. So, then we have a Bengali engineer and an expert called uh, Dr. B. N. De who devised and came up with his Kulti lock uh, scheme. So, another river which was uh, just located on the um, southeast. So, this was again another distributary of the Ganges called the Kulti. So, that was so Kolkata or this area actually it has no dearth of river or water body. So, it was quite easy to you know uh, find out alternative uh, channels or uh, you know um, other things that can be used uh, for, uh, for, for, for this uh, specific uh, you know, you know, for, for, for the uh, urban land or the urban area. So, what happened is that uh, uh, since uh, uh, I mean uh, 1930s this alternative outfall channel scheme uh, was uh, made was designed and finally, uh, Kulti lock it became the uh, official uh, outfall uh, channel uh, since the 1940s. And so, what happened is that as I had mentioned that these actually brought a massive change in the aquatic environment uh, of the city and more specifically in the aquatic environment of the marshes because we know that Bidyadari used to bring saline water because it was connected to the Bay of Bengal. But now, the canals the eastern canal system it was connected to the Kulti lock because no more Bidyadari was the outfall channel. So, the eastern canals it became connected to the Kulti lock and so, these canals used to carry the waste water or the effluent which was no more saline. So, these marshes transform from saline to non saline marshes and these became the east Kolkata wetlands. So, it was not the salt water marshes anymore. But the east Kol uh, Kolkata wetlands roughly an area of 20,000 hectares or more and uh, totally connected to the uh, Kulti river on the east and the eastern canal system. So, the canals and wetlands uh, it is a it is a part of an integral system one needs to understand this. So, we can never discuss canals of Kolkata without discussing wetlands. Again if you only discuss or focus on wetlands uh, I mean uh, it is very important for us to uh, know uh, about uh, uh, the functioning of the canals and also the history of the canals because the eastern Kol uh, east Kolkata wetlands entirely depends on the supply of wastewater from the canals. So, so now we see that how you know now we see the history of the emergence of uh, the uh, East Kolkata wetlands due to some changes or some alterations uh, in the uh, you know in the hydraulic engineering of this particular scheme. Yeah. So this is uh, from the EKWMA website. So this is Kolkata the city and this is her wetlands located at the 
peri arbor interface and so they are totally connected and this is the diagram or an illustration that captures the sustainable flows between um, the urban or the Kolkata city and its peri urban wetlands in the form of roughly 264 you know sewage fed uh, water bodies. And this is very important because uh, as I had mentioned that Kolkata has no separate sewage treatment plan. So, you can understand a city with more than 15 million people without any separate sewage treatment plan. So, it is an entirely you know it is an absolutely ecologically subsidized city totally dependent on the functioning of the canals and also the wetlands. So, so there is a sustainable flows between the two the East Kolkata wetland is dependent on the city because uh, it receives sewage water. So, the canal carries sewage water from the city to the wetlands and on the other hand Kolkata is totally dependent on the East Kolkata wetlands because you know uh, uh, I mean not only due to the fact that it generates ecosystem services, but due to the very fact that uh, Kolkata's sewage treatment totally depends on the East Kolkata wetlands in a natural way. So, that is why uh, um, East Kolkata wetlands is extremely significant and it is the largest uh, uh, you know uh, natural sewage treatment uh, for a particular uh, city like Kolkata not only in India, but in the entire world. So, a lot of research has been done on the uh, sewage recycling mechanism in this particular area and uh, one would be amazed to know that. Uh, the way sewage is treated or the way sewage is recycled by these wetlands is not through uh, you know uh, not through so called mainstream science, but so called uh, small scale low cost or cost effective uh, traditional indigenous folk sciences. And there is no documented history uh, on how you know uh, uh, these, uh, these people or the inhabitants or the wetland dwellers actually uh, started these practices from which period of time. But one knows that of course, it has a long history and uh, these inhabitants they practice um, uh, you know the PC culture by using the, uh, the uh, raw water or the waste water or the effluent and it is a total win win situation because uh, it provides livelihood generation or uh, it provides livelihood to the uh, to more than 1.5 lakh people uh, in these area. On the other hand, if you see this like on the other hand, uh, it uh, generates ecosystem services and the Calcutta also uh, I mean can buy fish at a very cheap and affordable price, because the distance between Kolkata and the East Kolkata wetlands is very less. So, it is a total win win situation where the East Kolkata wetland perform the role of uh, the sewage treatment plan provides uh, livelihood to many people uh, poor marginalized people and also uh, the city uh, reaps other benefits uh, from this ecosystem resource. But unfortunately, we are seeing that uh, I mean how uh, the changing political economic imperatives and how the changing development needs and perspectives of a city had really not been able to do justice to uh, her waterscapes, to her riverscapes and to her wetlands. So, again uh, uh, two images from 2002 and 2016 you can see how at a very fast scale uh, Kolkata is losing her uh, wetlands. And what is more important is that uh, uh, I mean uh, the wetlands uh, should not only be saved or protected for the sake of the wetland dwellers, but it is very important for us to understand the wetlands need to be saved also for the sustenance of the city. So, this is another map which was prepared by the Center for De Environment and Development. Uh, it is a little old map 2007, which shows a very interesting map, but like from 1600s uh, to the contemporary times, the changing uh, or the transforming trajectory of blue infrastructure in Kolkata. So, one single you know uh, picture capturing uh, the transforming tales of uh, uh, waterscapes uh, of this area. So, finally, uh, I mean it is a big issue and uh, I mean there can be 
debates unending debates uh, about why instead of knowing that these wetlands and the canal system and this entire network uh, is so very important and significant for the sustenance of the city why kolkata you know kept on encroaching upon her wetlands and why these uh, canals were not maintained at all since the post independence period so uh, just uh, i mean so we will not enter into the debate right now because uh, right now our whole intention was to just to make you familiar with the story uh, or the relationship between kolkata and her waterscapes and how uh, i mean this uh, the relationship it changed across uh, long term across long term temporal trajectory or across long term historical scales but one thing is that like um, if we if we uh, try to understand the polemics of urban planning and development then we'll find out that how during the 1960s it was said that uh, you know when uh, i mean uh, uh, if kolkata had to expand then in, it had to follow the uh, binodal mode of development which means that it should expand uh, north south but then how this plan uh, was not implemented and finally when the development perspective plan was launched in 1970s how this binodal strategy was totally violated by polycentric strategy which said that you know uh, the expansion would occur in the east west side so mostly in the eastern side and that had led to the you know uh, the conversion of wetlands into estate and this uh, area it is uh, extremely profitable and it is extremely uh, what to say i mean uh, the real estate speculators they are really attracted uh, to carry on uh, development projects to pursue development projects in this particular part of kolkata and it is going on in a rampant uh, you know massive scale and moreover the last point like uh, uh, recently uh, actually i think in i have to check it i think it is 2017 i just have to check so i have written it 2016 so maybe it was formulated in 2016 and it was actually passed in 2017 it's a, another interesting uh, bill so the draft land wetland uh, draft wetland bill which uh, says that no more the center is responsible for the protection of wetlands so it gives power to the state uh, you know uh, so far as protection of wetlands are concerned and one can understand like uh, what would be the grave consequence of this passage of the wetland bill if you don't have any uh, standardized you know central uh, litigation uh, regulation or policy yeah uh, so so the this is not only the story of degradation of canals it is also the story of displacement of people and so people residing on mainly the squatters so again uh, another uh, interesting uh, uh, terminology to legitimize and justify a uh, government's policy of uh, displacement because i mean there is a difference between uh, slums and squatters so slums means where you know people have their land deeds so it's complicated but then i'm trying to uh, make it more simple here so uh, and squatters means where the people they actually don't have the land deeds so uh, so they are uh, more on the verge of displacement so if the government wants uh, you know they can be evicted at any point of time but very unfortunately you know though these people actually they don't have um, uh, land deeds but they actually have uh, voters card so you can understand that how they are used as vote banks for uh, you know specific i mean during a specific regime of uh, particular government rule but then uh, they can be displaced or evicted at any point of time so same thing happened so this quarter is located uh, on the banks of the adi ganga uh, or the talis canal or for that matter the belaghata canal they were displaced like anything even you know raft was launched and it uh, really took violent turns and unfortunately uh, kolkata was ruled by the leftist government during that particular uh, point of time but uh, so a particular publication came out in 2008 uh, by the human rights law network and very 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 unfortunately you know myself being a, a kolkatan it's it's a pity to share this particular fact with you but it's real that uh, uh, i mean this a, a human rights law network they did a survey of the eight cities where eviction and displacement uh, had occurred due to the um, contemporary development projects and they found out that the displacement uh, that had occurred in kolkata was the most ruthless so finally a uh, lot of interesting developments are going on uh, one cannot deny that 
For example, there is this KIP, Kolkata Environment Improvement Project, and other river restoration schemes and beautification projects are going on. Rajarhat be, has been designated as a green city. So, previously, uh, uh, I mean, um, it was said that Rajarhat would become a smart city, but then there was some issue. And so, the state government uh, came up uh, with its own plan of making Rajarhat a green city. But it is again a pity and it is very unfortunate to think uh, 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 that, you know, though massive uh, uh, forestation, rainwater harvesting, recycling and wastewater recycling, all these uh, uh, schemes are being planned for this newly made Rajarhat. One has to keep in mind that Rajarhat has actually come up on the on you know huge acres and hectares of wetlands. So the wetlands had been filled and Rajarhat has come up, and now we are trying to make Rajarhat a green city with all these rainwater harvesting schemes and all that. So what I would like to say is these are to an extent quote unquote uh, cosmetic. Uh, initiatives uh, and uh, these cosmetic initiatives, uh, I mean, make us uh, blind or uh, you know uh, through. The, I mean, if we become attracted and if we uh, if these cosmetic uh, initiatives they start drawing our attention, then we'll actually uh, we'll actually be forgetting the metabolism or the real metabolism between the city and its wider ecological surroundings. So we would be uh, instead uh, mainly focused on what is known as uh, ecology in cities. So, the idea is not to you know uh, remain focused on and restricted to the ecology in cities concept, because what is more important is ecology of cities, where this kind of an idea is there that the city itself is an inherent part and parcel of the larger you know um, uh, of the larger environment. So, the city has an integral uh, relationship uh, between uh, I mean uh, with its environment, with its water bodies, with its riverscapes and one needs to pay you know real respect uh, to that fact. So, if we uh, start believing in the paradigm of ecology of cities, then we would be more uh, aware and conscious uh, to come up with uh, you know schemes or initiatives or policies that would be uh, viable in, in the long term that would really be uh, I mean that would really be able to address the larger goal of uh, sustainability rather than you know focusing on uh, sporadic and cosmetic uh, initiatives like uh, river restoration schemes here and there, but not really uh, uh, you know taking into concern the greater detail towards a more sustainable future. So, these are uh, some of the references. So, that uh, covers both uh, theories relating to urban ecology and paradigms like ecology in cities, ecology of cities and also there are um, some uh, references focusing on the primary case studies mainly talking about uh, the East Kolkata wetlands and the Eastern Canal system, some historical documents as well. So, that really provides a um, comprehensive picture of the uh, you know the larger uh, issues of water um, and uh, water society and sustainability within an urban space within the urban context specifically uh, Kolkata um, so far as this particular uh, study is concerned. Thank you.